let me illustrate particularly why I describe scientific code is not, is not simple, right? The reason is, is your final, your final product, right, is science, is this, you know, term of productivity. How fast out do you get whatever science or engineering that you need to do? And in that process, right, there's, there's, an, there's, there's immense different steps. There's, there's a lot of different steps. It doesn't just start with you get a code and you run it and you get your answer. You have to write that software. You have to think about how you're going to construct it. You have to test it. You have to prove that you're getting the right answer and that you consistently are getting the right answer, that you don't veer off. You can't just sort of test it once and move forward. You do your science. You do your simulation runs, right? You need to do your analysis your valid, and, and check the results that you got to make sure that you're getting still the right answer. You're maybe feeding that into an experimental design and, or adjusting your current workflow, adjusting the questions you're asking, and it's continuously going around. So you're cons constantly in this process of writing software, sort of running it, <laughs> making, sure, making sure you're getting the right answer, making sure that you're getting the science you want, figuring out what other questions you want to ask, and then just continuously on this cycle. So it's very few projects that just have a stable piece of code that they don't touch for five years, or 10 years, or 15 years. The codes are evolving. And in the process of, of what we've talked about so far at the training program, um, well, OK, I, I will confess that the, the I.O. is coming. Last year, we were, we were a little bit later in this week. But, but you've talked a lot about things like the applied mathematics and the programming models. This is sort of where we're going to focus here. These concepts of how you do these verification, how you do, why you want to do validation, um, and this larger concept of architecting and engineering your process and your code. OK. So as I said, we've talked a lot about sort of very specific application ideas, like so very specific um, uh, implementations of how you do the solution. The next two days, we're going to sort of talk about how you integrate them, right? And, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll sort of start that ball rolling. You can't just necessarily take, you know, your, your methods that you want to use to solve your science, maybe some I.O. algorithms, just mash them together. You can do that, I should say. And there are times where you can just take different solutions and mash them together, but you probably won't get the product that you really want to get out of that. You won't get the efficiency you want out of that. You won't get the quality you want out of that. You can still mash them together, but if you stop and thinking about it and make some intelligent choices along the way, you'll do particularly better. All right. So. The other reason we're talking about this is we wouldn't talk about this if this were easy and if everything kind of worked well and nicely together, right? It doesn't. <laughs> and, and it's true that when you start talking about the software practice, sort of the, and this is sort of a blanket term for thinking about your software, engin sort of your, your software engineering, right? How you write the code well versus the scientific process, right, of doing your science well. Right, making sure that your computational experiments are good computational experiments, well, they're often fighting. And they're fighting for a lot of different reasons. I mean, they're, they're fighting because every single thing you're doing takes time. Every time you have to write a new piece of code, every time you have to think about a you know, part of the process, every time you have to solve a new problem, it takes time. And that really is sort of people. They're, they're coupled, right? But, but you have to make this optimization with how much time, how many people you have, how much can you actually throw at these problems. And for the most part, you're all scientists or engineers, right? And you want to get your science out. <laughs> you want to get publications, right? And, and you want to move your career forward. And so that's where we've been for decades, right? That, that this, for good reason, is the driver. You want to get your science out. But I'm here to argue that if you don't think about these things, not to the point where you lose your whole career getting you know, wrapped up into, for example, so, you know, engineering, but, you know, but, but, sorry, I should say software engineering. But if you don't think about these things, your actual science will not be as, as much of a quality product as it could be otherwise. And you might, that sounded awfully buzzwordy, but I, but I mean that, right? And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is, why you want to be able to prove that you're your solution is right, or your answer is right, or your new questions are the good ones to ask. Uh, but I will say that uh, it is getting friendlier. <laughs> it's getting friendlier in a lot of different ways, and it's getting friendlier mostly because it has to, because the complexity of the systems is growing. The ubiquity of using HPC for doing science is growing as well, 
So there are more large systems on the floor that people can, can use to do their science, which means that this is confronting more and more people. So it has to become a little bit easier to do. It has to be that there are some reward mechanisms, right, to actually putting good thought into your scientific process and putting good thought into your software engineering. And um, this is, it's been a process, right, that, that this is being pushed hard, that there has to be a reward mechanism for it. That reward mechanism, in some cases, is just publications, right? Where can you publish a paper about your code? 15, 20 years ago, certainly, that was harder. There might have been a place where you could publish, like, look, this is my documentation of my code. Not, not sort of the documentation about how you use it, but documenting the methods you use and the process for why that code is a good code. That is a lot easier to do today. I'm not saying it's trivial, but it's a lot easier to do today than it was 15 years ago. And that is, you know, in terms of a reward mechanism, a real reward mechanism to say, put some thought into your, your code and be able to publish and talk to it. One thing I didn't say or at the beginning of this talk, and I don't know why, because this is always the issue. I can talk. I can just keep going. <laughs> and I don't think people are shy. We were asking questions, but please stop. This is, this is a conversation more than it is a talk, I would argue, right? Because these are, these are complex topics that, not complex because the math is hard, but because they're sociological, they're psychological, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're more nuanced in many respects, so just ask. <laughs> if we, I know I'll stop us from going down a rabbit hole, but it might be that that's a, but there might be that a rabbit hole that is the good one to go down to, to focus different parts of the talk. Yes? Are you going to say anything later towards diverse communities, meaning in terms of smaller colleges interacting with larger government labs? Because I see the representation here in this audience primarily being larger government labs, so research one universities. Especially, I, I mean, I agree with all the points you're uh, bringing up here, but if you have a smaller institution working with summer students to establishing a code, it's practically impossible to maintain that stride forever. So is there an incentive structure you're mentioning here, a re reward mechanism that essentially engages the whole community to have faculty members and students at smaller colleges being able to interact with that and being able to produce high-quality software that can of benefit to the general public. So I don't specifically have a slide, but there's there's multiple ways that I start that I touch on this, and I think other people will be able to comment on this over the next couple of days as well. The first thing I'll say is that there's there's practices throughout all of these. This is not the reward mechanism point first. There's practices through all of these that scale down, right? You know, so I will be talking about sort of, you know, if you are blessed with a code team, right, to go after a topic, to go after a code. What would you do? But I'll point out in all of these the ones that are the most crucial. Like every code should do the following things. In, it, in addition to that, in terms of collaboration with, with labs and reaching out into, to sort of to other institutions in terms of development, uh, I don't talk about that in as much detail. This is something that I think we could definitely talk about in a breakout, and I can think about articulating that. But I can say that the computing facilities that the DOE runs. We run on collaboration. Our goal is to collaborate with people who are interested in using supercomputers, preferably the ones we have on the floor, but, <laughs> but we, we reach beyond that at times, uh, and talk to them about how to move forward with developing codes, what kind of questions to ask, what kind of issues that we know are hitting people every day. And, and we collaborate pretty actively in that kind of model. So I can, I can say pretty emphatically that, that we are very open to working with people about this. And I can talk, as I said, we can, we can spin off in more detail. For the reward mechanisms, I mean, the, the reward mechanisms in the most case really have to do with recognition, right? And recognition, in, for the most case, and everybody in our field is, is publications. And that's an issue of having journals that recognize this kind of work. And as I said, they're growing, and we can, we can you know, we, should, we did this last year and we didn't do this again. We, we should collect that list of places where people could pursue that. Um, but on top of that, as I said, there's, um, I think I would argue, a growing sense of the value in these as research topics. So as real research topics to focus on based on your own, you know, as, 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 as its own unique thing. And that's another primary place where where there's some reward mechanism here, right? So that people actually doing distinct research in data provenance, for example, 
that wasn't a complete answer to your question because it's a fuzzy one too, but I, I'm happy to keep fo following up and, and ask me as we're going through these topics about how that could feed into smaller universities doing this. This is not meant to be focused on purely sort of a big university, you know, $5 million research project, but it's meant to sort of point out all the big questions you want to ask and guide you in making the decisions about what you can worry about based on what you have available, who you have available, and what time you have available. Um, and in that spirit, I'll say that, you know, as I said, we've got all the implementation things that we've been talking about in the training program, and a whole bunch, and I'm not going to walk through these, so this, is, this is not the point. There's a whole bunch of things about the process that you need to ask, and I think you've heard a lot of the terms already. You know, so questions about how portable your code is, how performant your code is, how reproducible the code is, right? I mean, Jack was just discussing this, right? That, that you might not get the answer from run to run and understanding that. And I will I'll show you sort of a fun chart. Now, I, I will caveat this a little bit by saying that it's a, it's a hair out of date, and I don't completely agree with every single arrow, but it gets you the right idea. But these are some of the, the, the concepts from the, last, from the previous slide, right? So these issues of correctness, usability, efficiency, reliability. And they're just a cross, it's just a matrix of them. And then that arrow says that, well, if you worry about efficiency, what impact does that have on correctness? What impact does that have on reliability? I could spend probably an hour talking about this chart alone. But the biggest point really to come out with this is that if you make choices about designing your code and thinking about your code, about, say, the efficiency of the code, the performance of the code, or the um, the usability, how easy it for somebody to pick it up and, and just to run with it, that has impacts on other features. It does. <laughs> we would like to hope you know, that you can write, for example, a very easy to use, performant, portable code. And that's, a, that's been a big conversation in the past, particularly in the past year. We've been, there's been a lot of conversation about this. But it is hard to do. It's not impossible, but it is hard to do. There is, there is a feedback between these things. And there's a reason. And you'll see some of that as we go forward in the next couple of days with some of the application-specific talks. If you want to get every last bit of performance out of, machine, out of a machine, or if you want to get the fastest time to solution, you might have to sacrifice some of the readability of the code because you're going to be writing perhaps very, very far down to the wire. But there are abstractions you can do that will make that easier to manage anyway, where you say that, OK, there's not, it's not going to be mingled in with every line of code. There's an abstraction level. And after that, I've really specialized. All right. So I wanted to talk a bit about the scientific process and some of the key points that you should always remember. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how to do all of them, because some of them are very domain specific. But remember in writing the code. And I think you, many of these you've, you've probably walked, up, walked into already. And the most important one, and the one I hope you have you, you know, experienced to some degree already, is validation. Right? Proving your code gives you an answer that you can trust. Historically, the best way you do that right, is you actually compare against experiment. Prove it, prove it against something real world that has been observed. And by domain, this varies dramatically. But this is a really crucial step. Right? And this has bit people. This has been, there's been you know, significant numbers of retractions, not like dominant. But there have been scientists who've had to retract you know, a series of publications because they, they found large errors in their codes. So think about this. right? Think about this early. Think about this as part of the workflow. A part to help you with that is the issue of verification. This is to make sure not that you're getting the right scientific answer, although it feeds into it, it's to make sure your code gives you the answer you expect it does. <laughs> and and it's a subtle difference, but it's a really important one. And it's a really valuable one for catching bugs, frankly, right? You know, you're, you're moving your code forward. You're trying to introduce some new physics or a new capability. And you want to be able to go back and check that, you know, your hydro solver is still giving you the answer it was giving you yesterday. And if it's not, why is it doing something different? And that's, that's part of this verification process. There are frameworks that people use to do this. Um, one of the, the common ways is you know, she'll write a unit test. So for every like, sort of piece of functionality in your code, you might run a, write a unique test to make sure that it's always giving you the answer you expect. There are, there are ways of sort of doing that in one fell swoop, like basically um, uh, tools that can help you manage large numbers of runs and do, do answer comparisons. Uh, but 
but the scale of this might be a function of the scale, right, of, of your development team. But this is very important. <laughs> History, I think, will tell most people who are developing code that if you don't have regular bug testing, because this is bug testing, so at some point, you will discover you introduced a bug and you don't know where or when you did it. <laughs> and, and that's what this helps you do. So doing this on a regular basis will at least have a benchmark where you'll be able to say, okay, wait, at least you know, by, by everything that I thought was important, I was pretty sure I was functional a week ago. And uh, that helps. <laughs> but this also helps keep up to date, I would argue, with, with validation, right? Because this also means that if your code starts deviating substantially and the answer you're getting, does it need to be revalidated? Normally, this is, you know, if I'm introducing a less substantial, large, new physics, I would worry about the validation, but this is also something to consider with verification as well. Um, one of the other ones to understand, and I, this, this has been discussed already, you know, that in the training program is error, right? All of these codes have an error. There's an error when you decide on your numerical algorithm, right? You know, and there's an error when you write the code. So there's ones associated with your algorithms and there's one associated with the computers and you should understand those. Those, those impact, say, when you go back to do your verification and you're looking and comparing your answers, you should know what your, you know, your machine error is. And, um, and just understanding that, right? Just understanding where you're hitting sensitivity issues. I'm not gonna harp on it because I know that the part, this has already been discussed. And, um, and you know, this is, a, this is a very distinct question based on what, what specific algorithms and methods you're, you're, you're adopting. The other bigger one, and it's related to verification and validation, is reproducibility. But this is not just like what Jack was discussing this earlier, right, of writing your code now and run your code an hour later and do you get the same answer. But it's the somebody comes back to you and says, I read your paper. This is awesome. You know, can I, can I try to do that? You know, can I see the code that you use to do that? Can you run those results again? Can you do that a year later? And I would argue this is a very crucial part to the scientific process, right? You know, being able to reproduce results is, is crucial. And so you need to track the information needed for reproducibility. You need to know exactly what version of the code you used, right? So many people will just take a complete tarball of the exact code and everything they use to compile it, right? And keep it with the data that, that they use to generate it. Oh, sorry, that the data that was generated from those experiments. So actually keep the code associated with it. You want to have a clear documentation. And this goes back to this issue of, you know, even publish it, right? This, this is feasible, right? You can publish a paper on the code. And understanding these issues that we'll get to in more detail about data provenance, what generated that data, how did that data come, what runs specifically, you know, did this, did this come from? And so did it come from like a run on January 3rd where there was a weird blip on the machine and the I.O. subsystem was behaving weird? This happens. <laughs> this happens, right? That you might have to track back to when the actual machine was having an issue. So it's not happen every day. This has not happened with every run. But when it does, the better data you have about these issues with, of reproducibility, the better able you're able to understand it and to address whether they impact you or not, and not just have to resort to, I'm not sure if they impacted me, so maybe I should run again, right? And have to do an entire experiment again. So this is, this is a large fraction of, of, of the things that I think are crucial to think about for the scientific process. There's a lot of data, a lot of information, I should say, on this, on this chart, and is useful for reference and useful for following up and, and thinking about what you might wanna do when you're plugging these parts into what you do on a daily basis. And what I would argue is plugging this into your workflow, your, you know, your larger workflow, like what you would keep you know, in a lab book historically. The other reason to do all of these things besides value, you know, having trustworthy results is this issue of collaboration, right? I mean, there's, there's not many people who, I'm sort of curious how many people right now sort of feel like they're, you know, they, they've got a code, it is their code, and they're sort of going forward independently, right, with no others. They're sort of like the, the lone wolf. Because it happens. I'm, not, I'm trying to imply that you're all alone. But, but there were, I think, three hands that I saw, right, out of this whole room. And, and so in most of the cases, there's a lab group <laughs> or a distributed group Right, you know, physically distributed group who are trying to work on these codes, who might be working on the same code, asking different scientific questions, or even working on the same scientific problem. And when you have a process 
you stay much better organized. You are able to write and collaborate much more clearly. Um, this is a this is truly a sociological thing. This is a, or, or, or psychological. I, I am not either of these either a psychologist or a sociologist. But but it's, it walks some line there for me, right? But it is true. If you've got clear processes in place, if you've got a, a clear description of what the code is doing, you can tackle these problems of of working with your collaborators and who trusts what much better. And I will tell you, as a lone wolf, <laughs> going forward. This will help you stay more organized. And you have to make a, a, a strategic choice, right? If you're doing this all alone, you can't do everything, right? Because all of it takes time. But it helps you stay more organized. And it does avoid that, that evening where suddenly you're like, oh, crud. <laughs> you know, which run was that? Or what data is that specifically associated with? Or whatever, right? You know, it helps that avoid those every once in a while panics about exactly whether you have exactly what you need. But the other, the other component to this is that Whatever you're doing, if you're working on this in a small group, the code will live longer than you wished it would. <laughs> it's not even than you expected. <laughs> it will live longer than you expect than you than you would ever would have thought. Most scientific codes today have components that have been around for decades. Really. I very few have been completely thrown out and have had every single line of code rewritten. And that means that just just imagine, right? You know, a grad student 30 years from now going, "Oh, <laughs> what what is this?" And and it's not to say that every bit of your documentation, every bit of all of this workflow will be associated with it, but that code will live longer. So the better it is, to, the easier it is to read, the easier it is to parse what's going on. Well, you'll at least be saving people later, but you'll certainly be saving people, saving yourself some heartache in the short term too. Really, I'm not joking about the 30 years. Yes? You, you may touch upon this topic later, but this last statement of yours conflicts very much with the statement that there is no explicit funding for code development. Yes. So I don't know when and where. But I would, I would <laughs> extend this discussion to a pretty large one. So I, I, don't, I don't dive into that, because really, in some regards, that's, this whole, that's a whole separate conversation. But what I would say is that, um, especially the issues I just touched on, are really scientific process questions and don't necessarily need you know, in substantial whole new codes to be, or new tools to be written to implement them, right? Um, without a doubt, just writing code, right, is, is not right now the most funded path in science and engineering. And I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. It is one of the issues with re reward mechanisms, right? Like, how, how do you do this when you can't find money to do it? You're motivated purely by wanting to get your science out, right? And at that point, this gets into these issues, just like you know, with the lone wolf of basically prioritizing, right? The priority is good science or engineering. Please don't. Please forgive me if you're an engineer, and I'm, not, I'm you know, I, I, I mean, sort of science and sort of a larger umbrella. The priority is good science or engineering, right? So the, the priority should be some of these processes in the in, in this on the science side, right? That focus on making sure you can trust what you do, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can alleviate the code development effort so that you are not going off and writing a whole new code. Or, or a substantial new code, but there are trade-offs when you do that, and talk a little bit about them. Um, I, I am sympathetic to the fact that there's no, there's really limited funding, right, to, to, to go develop codes, but it's sort of the working your way within this, right, within the community to do large-scale scientific computing. You sort of have to find a way that your requirements can be met with the with the limited funding that you might have. As I said, these are meant to be giving you the full list, and you have to subselect based on priorities. All right. If I didn't answer my, your question in a way that you need, just tackle me. I'm also getting filmed, right? So some answers might be more edited than others. <laughs> so the other, th this is, is, is obviously sort of a cartoon. But I wanted to give you know a sense of, and this is this is uh, 
not, not uniquely mine, although I've, I've changed it over time from the original slide, which came from my crew from Sandia, and I highly recommend you look up his work. He does some interesting stuff. Um, but when you're writing a scientific code, there's really sort of key areas, right, that you're thinking of that break the code down, right? I mean, you're thinking about primarily about like interfaces, right? Like how do your different components of your code interface, even if you're not doing something particularly complex, you're still going to have some process where you read in data, where you initialize data, or your problem, where you compute, where you spit stuff out, you know? And, and those are key components, right? So you're thinking about how you exchange information, really heavily about data, uh, how you move those all around. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just sort of say that this is a valuable cartoon, I think, to go back and look at when you're sort of thinking about, well, how, how do I start the process of thinking about what my code might look like? Even if you're piecing together codes from existing tools, right? Like you've got libraries and frameworks that you're using together. All of these questions still live, right? You should be able to answer these about what code you're putting together. A framework, you know, a framework would be something that gives you sort of some infrastructure for putting physics in but maybe provides you with you know, a way to discretize your, data, your, your scientific problem and output your data, you should still understand how they've constructed the interfaces for these, right? Because that impacts the scientific questions you're asking, that impacts the performance, it impacts almost everything. Um, and similarly, right, you know, understanding what the, the native data structures are in these codes. Uh, and as I think probably came up all last week and will come up again in the next two days, Understanding the data structures of whether it's code you're adopting or code that you're writing is pretty much the key to everything, right? That impacts your efficiency, that will impact your power efficiency, that will impact your time to solution. In many cases, it's moving forward more than even how many operations you have because of the cost of moving data. So this is sort of moving on, really, to talking about what the scientific, the software process is, right? To start thinking about how you write this code or how you adapt this code. And, and in any of these, what you want to think heavily about is besides the science that you want to solve, the architectures, the machine architectures that you want to use, but also what the future of those architectures might be. This goes back to some degree about thinking, well, your code will live longer than you ever hoped. But supercomputers have a cadence. There's a five-year cadence, pretty much, you know, on average. They are replaced every five years. This is their natural lifetime. You know, there's, there's, there's some reasons you know, but beyond that, but really, for the most part, they start dying after five years when they're not so much fun to use. <laughs> the, but, the, but they change, and so this means that the architecture is not necessarily like a complete revolutionary change every five years, but the complexity of the hardware increases. We don't see a trajectory anytime soon where the complexity of the hardware is going to sort of level off. We're in a period where the complexity is going up. It leveled off for a while, right? Like, it's, you know, there was, there was a period certainly in the, in the, in the knots and, the, and in the 90s where it wasn't increasing dramatically every five years. We're not there right now. We are increasing in complexity, right? So think about what trends the hardware will be going down when you're thinking about this code. because. Data structures will have a big impact. It doesn't matter what kind of hardware you're going to use. If you're going to be using the biggest supercomputers in the world, whether they're accelerated or massively threaded, if you're going to be using your campus resource, they're all going to be increasing in complexity. And they're all going to care a lot about what you do with your data and how you move it. And this is just not just your data, like what you're outputting, but the data you store in memory, how much you store in memory, how much do you need to move what you store in memory. The other component is, is also thinking about this very key thing, which is sort of the architecture of the code. That doesn't have to be a grandiose architecture, but you still need to understand your abstractions. And understanding your functional abstractions, so like the, the, how you separate your physics and your, you know, sort of your, your uh, uh, things like I.O. versus your parallel abstractions, so where you split that up to actually use parallelism in some flavor, whether that's threads or accelerate, and the path of the data through all of those things. That these, these sort of three things, really, like, are, are the huge component to the code and will have a huge impact on the performance of the code. Now, you can make great decisions. This is why there's no single answer. You can make great decisions about all three of these things and make an error in your implementation, and it can still be slow. But, but, but these are necessary 
to do well, I think, to have a good process. This type of thinking right, will also help if you need to worry about portability a lot. If you have to move between very different architectures and you want to worry about performance on all of those architectures, having good functional and parallel abstractions is the way you do that. You don't want to have to reach back up to the very top level of your code in order to change it. You want to be able to go down and say, look, there's, you know, this about at this level, right, is the point where I start optimizing for a particular architecture. All right. All that said, this list of things is the things that, that are the key items that any code, whether you are doing it by yourself or in a big team, where you really that you really need to have. And this will be talked a little bit more about. Some of these will at least will be explored more, right? Does anybody not use a repository of some flavor, like SVN or GitHub or something like that? Is there anybody who doesn't? Awesome. Good. <laughs> and that, that is so huge. And it might, you know, it, might, it might seem silly for me to point that and ask that specific question, but it is a huge thing. And this goes back to this issue of being able to say, well, what code, excuse me, what code did I run on that particular day? Being able to tag it and go back and grab that is a huge huge feature, and also being able to avoid catastrophic er you know, issues with development. Sounds like everybody sort of sold on it, and that's a good thing. Do not walk away from it. It doesn't really matter what tool you use. Don't walk away from it. Um, the other component to this, right, though, is, is also capturing the build process, right? So how do you build your code? How do you compile it? And capturing that is incredibly valuable. You will get a different answer on different machines based on how you build it. Right, and how you construct it. All right, sorry, how, how you compile it and what optimizations do you use. And the other aspects of this are, are the code architecture. This goes to what I was talking about before, where your abstractions are. Your coding standards. These don't have to be complex Microsoft level coding standards. All right? These should just be. <laughs> I'm just saying, their list is long, regardless of the benefit or impact or, or, or consequence. Their list is long. It doesn't have to be that. But there should be some things, like maybe, you know, depending on also what, what is crucial for your team. Maybe it's agreeing on the way to label things, right? Label functions. So how do you call, like, what do you call these functions so that you understand sort of maybe where it is in the larger code structure? Maybe it's how you talk about labels, how requirements for documentation, this is part of coding standards. Don't, don't think, I didn't think about documentation. It's in here. Requiring that people include those. So, so think about those, even for yourself, right? A standard of that, you know, you will have at least this amount of documentation in a particular routine to talk about how you use it is, is incredibly valuable and will save you in the long run. I, I, I just promise by experience that, that having that in there will be a benefit. The verification process, right? So by, you know, if, if gifted by gods with the, with the perfect solution, right, of somebody being able to run your code every single night, check every single unit, and give you whether it gave you the right answer or not, that, that's, that's fantastic. But it's not realistic for most people. But think about what will work. Think about some mechanism by, you know, that weekly, for example, or every couple weeks you're able to run the codes, do unit tests. This can be part of the coding standards where maybe you write a unit test for every, every functional unit that you write. But regardless, some process where you're running those and checking the answer, some regular cadence of doing that. And then finally, maintenance of support practices. Again, this is not, that kind of sounds scary, I think, for some people. This is not like, this is not, you know, I'm now going to open it up to the whole world and, you know, take everybody's bug reports. This can be even in a small group. How do you, how do you manage those, right? So you're running by yourself and you notice a question, right? You know, like an issue that you want to go back and look after. How do you track that even? How do you track the, the to-dos you have for the code? Inevitably, you start creating to-dos, and they're a little disheartening because the to-dos are always longer than what you can do. But just having the list even is valuable, right? Knowing that you thought to yourself, maybe there's a question about this at some point, is, is, a, is a valuable reference. It's sort of in the category of your own note-taking, right, in your own logbook of that things that to, 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 to talk about. But, but think about them. Think about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. And in this particular case, really, like even in the long term, if you think you might be writing a code that might be made public, all of these things become even more important. So you might push the priority of all of these issues a little bit higher if you think that your goal is maybe in two or three years that this is a code I'd like other people to use. 
And then finally, for the publicly distributed codes, I cannot, um, uh, it's again totally a sociolog sociological issue, but, but if you're going to distribute your code publicly, right? think about how you're going to distribute it. Think about how you're going to collect input from external, pardon me, external collaborators. So as soon as you distribute your code, it's likely that eventually somebody's going to want to contribute code to you. Well, how do you manage that? Is your code going to be you know, held tightly by you or by a small group you know, and all code will come through you? There's nothing wrong with that. Is it going to be a code that you're going to open up so anyone can publicly contribute to it? Or maybe there's a, there's a larger community of blessed developers. But, and there, there's many different models for this. But, but think about that. And related to that is attribution policies. So going back to these, these issues of reward, if you've got a publicly distributed code, how do you want to be acknowledged in publications when someone uses it? So think about that carefully, you know, and, and think about what's important to you and your domain and your group and your career. And make sure that's clear when you distribute it. Um, but there are obstacles to reusing code, whether this is libraries or somebody's framework or somebody's code. <laughs> and they're all issues, to some degree, they're all issues of control. If you own your code, you know every line that has gone into it, if you are trying to do something new and something explodes, you own those. You can probably think about them and understand how to dig deep into the guts. If you don't, if you're using a library, you don't necessarily have the ability to dig into the guts. But the benefit right, is you probably get a code that has been tested extensively, that has been debugged extensively, that has a large user group helping do all of those things, um, that has been validated and verified. But it might not be available the second you need it. And when you find a bug, you are not the one to go in and dig and, and diagnose it. So, so there, are, there are caveats to either choice you make. But a lot of people see, especially people who are using the biggest machines, you know, the day they go live, view using external hardware as a, software as a risk. I don't necessarily advocate that, because globally, not everyone can write their own code from scratch. And it's unfortunate if everyone is trying to write their own code from scratch, because there's an incredible amount of expertise that goes into developing libraries, that goes into developing other applications and, and tools. And it is worth exploring those. But you have to understand the trade-offs you have. Um, but as, as I was sort of saying that, if you're using external hardware, right, there are caveats. right? It might be hard to learn. You have to learn something. If you're writing something from scratch, you sort of know it, right? because you, you birthed it. right? But if you need to start using a new piece of software, there's a learning curve. Uh, it may not have everything you need. You might need new features. You might have to you know, reach out to the developers, and that might take time. And so this goes to this, this chart that you know, I was trying to develop, which has sort of talked about these different models of how you might use other pieces of software, right? Your black box user of an application. You just take code X, and you just want to run it and get your science out. And there are domains that work that way a lot. Like The majority of the work is done by basically black box users. Altering existing code bases, like maybe you're taking a community code and you're adapting it. You're implementing new physics and new capabilities. Uh, you want to use libraries or frameworks, you know, and, and down at the full bottom of that is you're developing an entirely new code. None of these are wrong, and if you go, you know, sort of look at this, I'd say that in many cases they're about right. That if you're a black box user, your speed to science is fast, but your speed of change is likely to be slow. And this goes back, you don't own it. If there's a problem, you don't own it. If you want to get on the, the biggest computer the day it goes live in sort of an early testing period, you probably can't, unless you're really good at that black box that you're using, in which case you're probably not an actual black box user. But as I said, you, you might be really fast at a solution. You can get a code. It'll run. They'll tell you what kind of platforms it runs on and what scale. And if you can use that, that's great. And, and you know, as I was sort of saying, at the total end of the spectrum is writing your own code. And the benefit of that is that you know exactly what you want to do and you can target it. But the speed can be slow. The speed to science, I should say. The speed to your solution can be slow. The speed of change might be fast because you can just go and implement it. But this gets to why you know, this chart is a little bit funny. right? Well, the speed of change is fast if you have the ability at that point to throw everything aside and go deal with the bug or implement the new physics that you need. right? Um, the point really is that there are huge trade-offs. Um, it's all an issue of control and effort. I don't mean control here in a bad way. Like some people are, you know, they, they talk about control. It's like, I need to own everything. This is not that. But it's where do you have the control and where are you putting your effort? And if you 
in any of in any part of that spectrum, right, from libraries or new codes or black box users, you're making a pretty big trade-off. And you just need to be cognizant of it and know how that will impact you. Right. One of the uh, near final things I wanted to comment on is this concept of self-sustaining software. Right, so I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with open source software, right? You know, and software that is maybe even supported by a community. We'll have a talk about that in a few minutes. But there is a concept that a code written in the right ways, with the right documentation, with um, with clear descriptions of of flow of sort of. A, accreditation and how changes get moved into production code, there's a concept that if you have a community interested in a code that you can actually have a self-sustaining piece of software. You need to have the community, right? And that, that can take a while to, to build up. But we see this. Um, Sean, who's sitting back there, right, is going to talk about the impact of community codes on the astrophysics community. And the astrophysics community has had actually a lot of luck with community supported codes. And in some cases, codes that don't have a unique owner. You know, they, they have an owner. They have somebody in charge of them. But there's not a single development team sitting somewhere. They have very clear rules fa falling into these categories about how those m codes move forward, how they take changes. And so this is a consideration, especially when you don't have the ability to support a very large code, or you don't have funding. <laughs> to support a code. <laughs> if you've got people who are using it or who are interested in using it, it's something to consider. And one of the other, this is sort of one of, this is two of three last thoughts. Um, I've already made my comment that your code will live longer. Code lives for decades. Scientific code really does live for decades. It is not something that gets thrown away and rewritten. And, and so there, there is some thinking, and some people will say this, that you know, code today, we just have to wipe it all out and start again. And I, I don't agree with that. I'm not saying that, that there's, no, there's no argument to be made for the other side of that. I don't agree with it. Um, but this is a chart I've seen in different flavors many times, right? where you're, if you start talking about legacy codes and you're talking about billion-way concurrency and the kind of things you'll see at Exascale, that effectively using these machines is just not possible. I don't believe that is possible. I mean, that, that is true, um, in part because these codes are huge investments. Not necessarily just money investments, not just because somebody decided this code, you know, I'm going to give you $2 million for five years to develop it, but because in terms of people time and science investment, they're huge. And that is generally recognized. And very, very rarely are people just willing to throw everything up in the air and walk away. So, I believe that many codes, even when we might be struggling with the path forward, are going to be moving forward onto these next machines. There will be some topics that if you have, you know, if you've got no way to abstract your data structures and deal with a complex memory hierarchy, that might be harder. But the codes will, are unlikely to die. We have never seen such a massive, massive die off. And my last thought I will say is that when you are writing your code, when you're adapting your code, when you are adopting a code, think about where you want to run. If you want to run on your university cluster, that is a different consideration than if you want to run on the top 10 or 15 machines in the world. They are not the same beasts. Eventually, one of those top 10 or 15 machines, you know, sub parts of it, you know, or slices or single racks, might end up at your university, but they are not the same beasts. I'll give you a dinner talk that hopefully will be entertaining about this, but they are not. And you will not have the same ecosystem or the same capabilities. There is not one right choice about where you should run, <laughs> but, but just think about it. You know, g give some thought in the midterm to where you would like to do your science, what scale your science will need. And, and a g concrete example of this is, you know, look, there's, if you look at the breakdown on Mira, this is actually last year's data, but it stays pretty much the same about what the codes are written in. Almost everything's Fortran and C++, and I will tell you that most of the C++ is not high-level C++. It is not. <laughs> so, so we're still talking about a world of Fortran, C++, and C. Charm++ um, is a, is a um, it's more than a library. 
it's not quite right to describe it as a library. But you'll hear about this tomorrow, but there's a molecular dynamics package in AMD that runs on top of it. But we're still talking about something that is fundamentally written in C++. What, do these codes developed in the last like year or decade or like? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the, it, most of these are codes I, truly that have been around for a very long time. They are all undergoing very active development. So without, a, without a, a exception, I think I could say that they still have developers actively making changes to them. But there are, for example, in this year's insight on Mira, so this is the primary mechanism for awards on Mira, there's only a couple codes that are brand new. It would be interesting to see a, the difference in that pie chart for graphs that would have codes developed in the last decade or five years or so. On the ones that we see compete to use the leadership computing platforms, most of them are still fundamentally written in Fortran C and C++. This bypasses some concepts, right? So domain-specific languages. There are some codes that are using domain-specific languages, but the way that breaks down is that they're still functioning with C++ and, or, or, you know, or for, C++ or C <laughs> implementations of those. Um, there are very few codes that are using very high level languages like, like Julia, for example. It's a fantastic language. Or high level programming models like, say, UPC. So it's not a judgment against them, but the reality is, is that in terms of performance is one, but that's not the dominant one. Availability, those languages aren't there yet. I'm just thinking in terms of the breakdown between Fortran C and C++. Ah, OK. That, the Fortran bit. Fortran's still pretty big. Yeah. Now, you, I, I think we, we, I've, I was just running some of this data for this year, um, and it, it still looks relatively consistent. Most of the new, like the two new codes that were in this batch are actually C++ codes. But mostly, their kernels are written Fortran. Um, and, and that's not universally true. There's people who, you know, for example, are using Python, but their kernels are written in C. The caveat I'll say to that, though, right, even for those who are running with Python, right, that's still tricky in these environments. It's not impossible. I'm not, like, trying to walk you away from it. But it's harder. And it's harder to run on day one. And, uh, and there's, there's a handful of reasons for it. That in terms of time, I, I, I will sort of defer this to break and also to, to tomorrow night's dinner. But I'll tell you that to just consider it. I'm not trying to say, consider Fortran, <laughs> if you're not already. But, but understand that what you write will have an impact on, on how easy it is to port your code, how easy it is to run. Um, and this does not exclude things like domain-specific languages. does not exclude. Um, programming models that might be a little bit higher, but that are written you know, fundamentally still in one of these that are relatively easy to port. Charm++ is an interesting example, and I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to, to steal anything that Jim Phillips will say, because it's, it's a communication level, but communication package, it also helps, you know, it does load balancing, it has a lot, it, it has a lot of impact on your data abstractions, um, and it is, it is harder to port, and the reason is, though, is because it talks to the lowest level communication algorithms. And so normally, the Charm++ developers are knocking on our door, or actually recently we've just gone and told them, come and get Charm++ working. Without that, for example, NAMD really wouldn't have functioned. But, um, but, the, but fundamentally, right, these systems are not as feature rich as your Linux box. It doesn't have a full flush Linux kernel sitting on there. And just remember that. That's the real takeaway. Um, and the last thing I will say is thoughts going in, um, riddle people with questions. As I said, I can't, I, I, it's an incredibly, it's really kind of an amazing group of people we have to talk to about applications today. With a lot of history, people who have gone through a lot, <laughs> a lot more history even, you know, th than I have, you know, in terms of seeing transitions in architectures and seeing, you know, transitions in, in the ecosystem of, of large scale computing in the US uh, and beyond. So, so don't hesitate. Um, riddle them. They've been prepared. <laughs> They're also used to it, I think. Yeah, I'm just curious if you have a recommendation on like a boilerplate license. If you just have some code on GitHub, if you don't, you don't care if people use it or what they do with it, but if they like blow up their computer, you don't want to be responsible. Yeah. For it. I know there's the GPL that a lot of people use, but I imagine there's 
Um, the GPL, a lot of people do use GPL. There's a caveat to GPL that as, as you go forward with your code, depending on how you want to collaborate with certain people, particularly vendors, the GPL one can introduce some issues. Um, so a lot of people use Berkeley license, and, that, and that's worked, worked pretty well. But we can point you to, to a couple different licenses that people normally put on their thing. But I will just say, I mean, since I, since I said this, right, the issue with the GPL license, for general collaboration, there's no issues at all with it. But there's, there's a larger issue that you might have, for example, if you're giving your code to a vendor, that anything that ends up in that code right, is supposed to become GPL'd. And so a vendor might have some concerns about making changes to a code if you're collaborating with them. But yeah, the BSD and the Berkeley are, are two common ones. Um, I just, I just, I was wondering uh, regarding the, the licensing. What is, what, what would be your way to, your suggested way to actually try to encourage, if not enforce, uh, acknowledging work? And actually, the very permissive licenses are, are very bad from this point of view, because both for a researcher, it's not ethical for a researcher to simply lift a piece of code and use it and rebadge it. Yes. But in terms of industry, there is no ethical concern there. You can lift whatever you can as long as it's within the, the lawful uh, boundaries. And uh, you can rebadge it as a product and suddenly earn huge money on, on, on my work or someone else's work. So there is a conflict of interest here. And from that point of view, the, the less permissive licenses are somehow I think a more fair option because at least there is this there is this shadow of a, of a, of a yeah. security. Although nobody cares in, in practice. Well, one can go to the EFF and get help, and I have seen that happen, but it's very rare. One other possibility too, um, and I'll, I'll I'll let you is is you can't add another tier. Basically, a user agreement for people who are using it. Now that requires maintaining it. Um, but it is a mechanism to sort of, you know, make sure that they sign a document, and then you can iterate with your institution about that document. But it sort of says, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm going to use it this way. I'm not going to use it this way, and, and more importantly, you know, the, your acknowledgement requirement.